This is the CBS Evening News. Dan Rather reporting. Good evening. Thousands of soldiers and police are patrolling the capital of Venezuela tonight. They're trying to keep the peace after three days of bloody riots touched off by government-ordered price increases. The toll in Venezuela, at least 200 dead, hundreds more injured. CBS News correspondent Juan Vasquez is on the scene in Caracas. Scattered firefights are still raging in sections of the capital today. The soldiers exchanged fire with a sniper for the better part of an hour as armored cars threaded their way through the narrow streets of this working class neighborhood to surround the building. The beleaguered government of Venezuela, shocked by the fury of this week's riots, brought an additional nine infantry battalions into Caracas to gain the upper hand, but sporadic fighting continued in some areas. Even under the state of siege, there were a few outbreaks of vandalism, too. This mob was so brazen, they looted a grocery store while police stood by and watched helplessly. Hundreds of store owners have been wiped out. It was a popular mutiny, said the owner of this burned-out hardware store. Now, I'm left with nothing. The government claimed most of the city was under control, except for a few pockets of resistance. The rioting was sparked by price increases designed to help Venezuela repay its huge foreign debt. But the price of austerity has been political chaos. The rioters are sending a message to Washington as well. The uh, rigid position of uh, U.S. government has been the main factor that has created all these tensions in the relations between creditors and debtors. As President Perez said yesterday, these measures are the measures of the government of Venezuela and not the measures imposed from abroad. The riots left much of the capital looking like a huge garbage dump that could take weeks to clean up. Cleaning up the political and economic mess will take longer. Until this week, Venezuela was considered the region's showcase democracy. The fear of other Latin American leaders is that if this sort of political violence can happen here, it can happen in their countries as well. Juan Vasquez, CBS News, Caracas. In this country on the labor front, after a 17-month-old contract dispute, it's come down to this. Both sides reportedly are studying an offer aimed at blocking a strike by an Eastern Airlines union before tomorrow night's midnight deadline. If there is no agreement, only White House intervention could block a walkout that threatens travel all across the country and the very future of the 60-year-old airline. Correspondent Peter Van Sant reports. Down with Lorenzo. Eastern Airlines machinists late this afternoon began a series of disruptive protests at airports across the country, despite new hope from federal mediators that the labor dispute may be settled at the bargaining table. I am optimistic, always optimistic, that we're looking for that breakthrough. We've been looking for this breakthrough now for many weeks. The so-called breakthrough is a new contract proposal from Eastern to its machinists, who plan to strike at midnight tomorrow. Details have not been made public, but the machinist reaction has been lukewarm. As long as it's favorable, I'm sure everybody will be for it. But if it isn't, we're all for strike otherwise. Eastern received bad news today when its pilots union said no to the company's latest contract proposal. Eastern's management knows it won't be able to break a machinist strike unless its pilots cross the picket line. Despite the pilots' rejection of Eastern's latest contract offer, the two sides are still talking. One source close to the talks has told CBS News that unless Eastern comes up with a new breakthrough contract offer, the pilots will honor the machinist picket lines, which could lead to the demise of the airline. Or I'm afraid Eastern is, is going to uh, go through this juncture and perhaps end up in the, um, in, in the corporate graveyard. Eastern's machinists are hoping to spread the misery around by having fellow union brothers at Northwest, U.S. Air, TWA, United, and Piedmont Airlines join them on the picket lines. This is a fight for all of labor, not just for the machinists. Our brother pilots on the other carriers also understand that this is a fight that goes beyond just Eastern. One last hope for averting a strike is presidential intervention with a special board to meet with both sides. But tonight, that hope is fading. Peter Van Sant, CBS News, Atlanta. The John Tower fight drones on. White House officials let it be known today that President Bush has failed to persuade a single Senate Democrat 
to vote yes on the John Tower nomination, and he's not sure about all the Republicans. This, as the full U.S. Senate began formal debate on confirming Tower. Final up or down vote expected next week and widely expected to be no. There is growing talk that President Bush is prolonging deliberately the Tower nomination fight, not because he thinks he can win, but because he is out for vindication and perhaps to play some politics. Other Republicans reportedly may be out for retribution and revenge against Democrats. On Capitol Hill, Chief Washington correspondent Bob Schieffer begins our coverage. Secretary of Defense must be a person suited by personal conduct, discretion, and judgment to serve second only to the president in the chain of command for military operations. The committee concluded that Senator Tower cannot meet these standards and therefore should not be confirmed as Secretary of Defense. It is the most incredible cobweb of fact, fiction, and fantasy that I've seen in the decade I've been privileged to serve in this institution. And so the great debate officially began, Armed Services Chairman Nunn doing most of the talking for Democrats today. On alcohol, Nunn says the pattern is unmistakable. Tower has a drinking problem which should bar him from holding a sensitive post. We're not talking about Secretary of Interior. We're talking about someone that is next to the president at the very top of the nuclear chain of command. Whiskey is not an unknown commodity uh, to the people of America and to the people who have been important in its government. There were also sharp differences over Tower's close ties to the defense industry. Senator Tower's decision to provide, to provide consulting services on arms control matters just after serving as an arms control negotiator in the view of the committee, and in my personal view, crossed the line with regard to the revolving door. By this logic, the ideal guy to be Secretary of Defense would be a fella that just came in on a turnip truck who would agree not to ever make a decision related to turnips or to trucks. And there were more differences over Tower's alleged indiscreet behavior around women. We did find a number of examples of personal conduct which the committee found indiscreet. Not a shred of evidence that somehow he wouldn't carry out his duties to make sure that people who are serving in our military forces, the women who serve in our military forces, wouldn't be harassed. But it was when Glenn of Ohio started quoting from the confidential FBI file about Towers drinking that the Republicans cried foul. It seems to me it's unfair to the nominee. We can't get anything else out of the report. Now, can we have that matter expunged from the record and the media? The Tower controversy has spilled all over Washington. At the White House, Barry Goldwater argued Towers should not be disqualified just for taking a drink. If they chased every man or woman out of this town, shacked up with somebody else or gotten drunk, there'd be no government. In a sense, that is the strategy that the Republicans are following to put Washington on trial rather than debate Tower's qualifications. Republicans still don't have the votes to win this fight, but two sources familiar with the strategy say the aim now is to show the Democrats that even if they do win, some of them could be badly cut up in the process and that from here on, no victory will come cheap. Dan? Thank you, Bob. CBS News White House correspondent Leslie Stahl is standing by there tonight with more now on what's behind President Bush's purposely drawing out the Tower nomination fight. Leslie, it appears to be a losing fight. Why are they fighting it to the bitter end? Well, the, the primary goal is not to have uh, new votes for Senator Tower. The main goal is to make President Bush look like a tough fighter. Uh, they're convinced here that they're probably not going to win. But look at Senator Tower's speech yesterday when he attacked the Senate. That's the kind of thing you say after you've already lost. The strategy is to have the president out front persuading American people that he chose Tower because he's qualified, not because of some old campaign debt. And there's one more thing. As Bob said, they want to make the Democrats pay. They believe the Democrats are playing politics with this. But is bipartisan cooperation overall now dead for the at least the early part of the Bush term? Well, no, Dan, they're trying to have it both ways, and that's a challenge for the president, because while the Republicans are out there attacking the Democrats publicly, he has to try and limit the damage through a behind-the-scenes uh, sort of massaging of the Democrats. Aren't they doing anything at the White House to get Tower votes? Well, they are. They tried to gin up an avalanche of phone calls and letters uh, to key senators. But John Tower is pro-choice. And the usual people who do that for uh, Republican presidents are the anti-abortion religious groups, and they're not participating, so that's fizzled. And there's one more thing, Dan. Congressional sources tell us 
that the Republican governor of Texas, William Clements, is letting it be known that he is not for this nomination. But I have to tell you that Governor Clements himself is denying that. Thank you, Leslie. Still to come on tonight's CBS Evening News, Frank Courier on a Michigan woman who thought a television show was too suggestive and had some suggestions of her own. And David Dow on Seattle sea lions and some suggestions about them from fishermen. The breaking point by the Ayatollah's death threats against British author Salman Rushdie. Today, there were signs the two countries want to settle their differences. CBS News correspondent Tom Fenton is following developments in London. The Iranian chargé d'affaires, expelled from Britain Tuesday, has reportedly called from Tehran three times to try to set up a meeting with British officials in Geneva. An apparent last-minute attempt by Iranian moderates to head off a complete diplomatic break. They are somewhat reluctant to go through with this. They're still looking for some ways out of the confrontation. The British government is also looking for a way out. Tonight, Foreign Secretary Sir Geoffrey Howe said that Salman Rushdie's book is deeply offensive to Muslims. But Britain insists there can be no talks until Ayatollah Khomeini's death threats against Rushdie are withdrawn, and the Ayatollah rarely backs down. Here's the dilemma of a political system which has one man who claims such prophetic authority and who puts himself outside and above and beyond the game of politics. The firestorm of protest over satanic verses continues on both sides. At least 20 persons have now died in demonstrations against the book. There was a rally last night in Paris supporting Rushdie, and more than a thousand writers and publishers worldwide signed a letter defending the book. But some worry that the damage has already been done. It's going to make publishers and writers very reluctant in the future to comment in any way on the affairs of Islam or indeed of any other group where they think they might get a similar reaction. What started months ago as a Muslim protest against a book has become a worldwide clash between religion and free speech and may even have blocked attempts by Iran's moderates to finally open doors to the West. Tom Fenton, CBS News, London. West German officials said today they cracked a major high-tech spy ring. They said they seized several suspects and extensive evidence. West German television reported the suspects are computer hackers who got and sold to the Soviets the passwords and codes for U.S. Defense Department and NASA computers. Maybe ribald good humor or unacceptable vulgarity, but whatever it was, executives say they'll be more careful next time. Frank Courier has our report. It's called Married with Children, Fox Television's popular Archie Bunker brand of blue-collar comedy, a show that's for some outrageously funny, for others insultingly vulgar. When you have that kind of skill, you don't need responsibility. There were women running around it with garter belts and nylons, and one removed her bra for the strangers and asked how she looked. They talked about vibrators. Watching with her children for the first time, Terry Rakolta of suburban Detroit was so offended, she wrote a letter to all 45 companies that advertise on the weekly series, demanding they pull their commercials. How can they take our money, spend it to endorse soft pornography? In an unprecedented response to just one viewer's letter, several huge corporations agreed and pulled their ads from the show. Said McDonald's, we felt the program was not consistent with our family image. Procter & Gamble replied, we share Mrs. Ricolta's interests in quality TV programming. Industry observers say yanking the ads off the air reflects a new corporate sensitivity to the growing lineup of provocative sex-oriented shows which would have been unacceptable before cable television boomed. The sitcom Married with Children depicts the Bundy family of Chicago, a frustrated shoe clerk, his lazy wife, and two whining teenagers. The dialogue laced with double entendre is what Fox calls breakthrough television. Dad, it's 12 degrees. <laughs> and why are we both sweating? The show right now is getting between 20, 20, 20 and 25 million people that are loyal fans every week. So I don't know who this one person really is or how much importance we should give to her one particular point of view. I wouldn't have said this a month ago, but I can say honestly that one person does make a difference. Following Terry Ricolta's one-woman write-in campaign, some companies have vowed to screen more closely the content of programs like Married with Children. 
which draw high ratings, but also, critics insist, stretch the limits of good taste family programming. Frank Trier, CBS News, Chicago. The general controversy over tabloid television will be examined in detail tonight on the CBS News broadcast, 48 Hours. That'll be at 8, 7 Central Time. We compared the Subaru Justice Day on Team Picture Day for the New York Mets at their spring training camp in Port St. Lucie, Florida. As the players settled down for their official photograph, words were exchanged between right fielder Daryl Strawberry and first baseman Keith Hernandez. Strawberry swung at Hernandez, but like most baseball fights, it was a no hitter. The two men later met with a psychologist, and Strawberry, who wants to renegotiate his contract, then left camp, saying this would be his last year with the Mets. Wade Boggs of the Boston Red Sox is a five-time American League batting champion. His lifetime batting average is 356. He made just 11 arrows last year. Hall of Fame figures. But the most discussed figure in Wade Boggs' life these days is a woman. Bob Fall reports. Wade Boggs is the closest thing baseball has to an automatic hit machine. 200 or more hits six years in a row in the history of the game, no one has ever done that. Good evening, Dale Arnold. In for Not many have stirred up such a tempest either. The guy's got no character whatsoever. He's a bum. What the married father of two did was keep a mistress, Margot Adams, on the road with him for four years, then dump her. After which she slapped him with a $12 million lawsuit, dragged their kinky sex lives into print, and went on TV talk shows to describe how all-star Wade Boggs treated his teammates. What he did was he'd make sure they were set up in a compromising position, and then he'd break into the room and take pictures. After first denying everything, Boggs confessed and apologized to teammates, fans, and his wife. We're trying to get on with our lives, and I love him. Wade Boggs now says he can't keep apologizing the rest of his life. Put it this way, I didn't deal drugs, I didn't use drugs, and I didn't kill people. But I didn't break the law, and that's the way I feel right now as a criminal. No one who's understood the game has ever accused professional ball players of being choir boys. Over the years, chasing skirts has been as much a part of baseball as baiting umps or throwing spitters. In that sense, what is unique about Wade Boggs is that he got caught. He is not alone. Pete Rose was just called on the carpet, reportedly, for consorting with gamblers. American League MVP Jose Canseco was nabbed, speeding 125 miles an hour. Even squeaky clean Steve Garvey, a Christian spokesman, confessed the other day he has fathered two illegitimate children. Most uh, major league athletes are 15-year-olds are in 25-year-old bodies. You know, in our day, girls were just happy to be girlfriends. Now they want to be, now they want to make a profit on it. People say sex shouldn't be brought into the game of baseball. I guess it's there a lot more, it's a lot more prevalent than people realize. To young fans, all the commotion matters not one bit. Hey, how many cars of Wade Boggs do you have? Around 100 or something. And you still want more? Yeah. To many parents, though, the scandal does real harm. But there are many children who I feel would look at it and say, it's okay. You know, look, he does it, it's okay. And it's not okay. The only reason Boggs can block out the controversy, say his detractors, is because the only morality he understands is a base hit, the only evil, a pop-up doesn't give baseball black eye whatsoever. Granted, uh, you know, I, I let down the, the population as far as a role model, but, uh, um, you know, what can I do? He is, everyone agrees, in a class by himself. Bob Fall, CBS News, Winter Haven, Florida. Broad daylight. Authorities seem powerless to stop them. And as David Dow reports, that has tempers rising. It may be Seattle's fastest growing, most controversial outdoor sport. Look, look at the sea right down there. Watching the sea lions at the Ballard Locks. Sometimes it's hard to believe the spectators are seeing the same players. You know, when you look at them, they look like kind of like a, a pet dog, you know, like a nice puppy you'd like to pet. Well, if it looks like your pet dog, you're talking about a 600-pound dog with bad breath, tremendous fangs, and a very bad temper. 
and a voracious appetite for steelhead trout that arrive here each winter to ascend a man-made fish ladder, the first step to their spawning grounds in distant streams. Those fish are trapped there by the locks, and uh, the sea lions are in there, and heck, they've got a, a heyday. You know, it's just the smorgasbord. And therein lies the controversy. Do sea lions, long protected by law, have unlimited dining rights on a threatened steelhead run? Or do the fish and fishermen have rights too? Steelhead need as much protection as the sea lions. The sea lions have been scapegoated. The Department of Wildlife will admit that the steelhead run was in trouble before the sea lions ever started feeding here in 1981. Officials and eager helpers have tried almost everything to chase the sea lions from the locks. Noisemakers. Bombs. Even rock and roll. But each year, the determined outlaws return from California with more friends. So, using dart guns, officials have marked them for more travel. For a new effort, optimistically called Operation Goodbye. The animals are trapped, caged, and trucked 200 miles down the Washington coast. About two dozen of Puget Sound sea lions are considered troublemakers, and scientists hope they won't be back. But even they seem prepared to be outsmarted once again by the sea lions. We certainly know where Seattle and where Puget, where Puget Sound in Seattle is. If they want to come back to eat more steelhead, they will simply swim back. Meanwhile, on the streams where steelhead fishing is a near religion, sea lion fury is rising. Well, are you from California? Put them in your swimming pool and raise them. Breed them, make more of them, but keep them there. Well, I think they ought to shoot them. Two sea lions died in captivity. One of them was found to have a bullet wound. And some fear it won't be the last such attack if the sea lions turn Operation Goodbye into Operation Round Trip. David Dow, CBS News, Seattle. And that's the CBS Evening News. Until 48 hours on tabloid television tonight at 8, 7 Central Time. Dan Rather, see you then. TV, television for sale, and no holds are barred. What the hell's going on in this country? 48 hours tonight. This is CBS.